what's going on guys welcome back to consuming crime with jenna and jules it is jules here and today we are going to be going over a new documentary called click for murder which in seems that a lot of these episodes are based in england this very first one is um but before we get started make sure you give us five stars wherever you are listening and also make sure to check us out on the patreon at the five dollar official level you'll have available six episodes ready to listen including the aaron hernandez series as well as two additional episodes each month. At the $7 all access level, you'll have all of the previous benefits plus our regular content with no ads. And at the $12 VIP level, you'll have all of the previous benefits plus not only do you get to listen to me tell the story, you get to watch me tell the story. Without further ado, let's jump into it. This documentary is interesting because, well, first of all, it's 45 minutes and a lot of it is fluffer. The reason I know this is because normally with a 45 minute episode, I'm able to get at least four pages of notes, but I was only able to get two. By fluffer, I mean that they took a lot of time talking about grooming, exactly what it is, and they also took a lot of time psychoanalyzing the the murderer in this case, which I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to do it. I'm just not like I'm the first person that's gonna psychoanalyze somebody but not a murderer and definitely not a murderer and a rapist this is a series on Netflix and right now I'm covering season one episode one they pretty much tell you where it ends up and then they go back and they say okay how did we get here but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take that part out and kind of try to go in chronological order this case is based out of Leicestershire County in England you're annoying you're really annoying. The entire day he did not play. The entire day he slept. And now he's deciding to get his loudest toy and just like make it about him. This isn't consuming crime with Coda. This is consuming crime with Jen and Jules. That's not your name, is it? He's really looking at me like a little boy. It's so sweet. We have a 15 year old girl named Kaylee, Kaylee Haywood. And she is the second of six children. According to her mother, Stephanie, she was a very happy girl. She was really into her schoolwork and all of her friends lived far away so she usually spent time on social media and she was mostly home. On October 31st, 2015, Kaylee received a message on social media from Facebook specifically from 27 year old Luke Harlow who at the time lived six miles down the road from her. He didn't seem to be deceitful about who he was or his age. She was aware that he was 27 years old and she didn't seem to mind much. Which at 15 years old, you might think it's even kind of cool that someone older is hitting you up. I don't know. The messages progressed very quickly, and within 15 or 20 minutes, he asked her to come to a party. Within 90 minutes, he had her phone number, and detectives believe that he used this as a tactic to um, leave less of a digital footprint. I, I have to disagree, just because whether it's a text message or on social media, think you can clear it no matter what but that's what they thought it was they start getting into who luke was they get into his background his education what he does for work i'm going to tell you guys right now i don't care if you want to go watch the documentary and figure out who luke harlow is you like go ahead feel free Um, but i'm not going to sit here and talk about it they go on to say he's not somebody you would suspect and yada yada he's a 27 year old messaging a 15 year old That's somebody that you would suspect, first of all. When looking at his profile, he had over 1,700 friends on Facebook, and he had 300 pending friend requests. Not not pending for him to approve, but pending that he had requested other people. Over the next two weeks, they exchanged over 2,500 messages between Facebook and text. I don't actually know if that's a lot. Um, I'm not big on texting, so it sounds like a lot. But overall, that's a little weird. He had convinced her that he was her boyfriend, and on November 3rd, asked if they could be friends with benefits, which is really weird. Of course, he starts grooming her, which they use this term a lot in this documentary, and that is a thing. Um, If you guys have not heard of grooming, grooming is essentially when um, typically somebody older will target someone younger and start to kind of train them into being acting the way that they want them to act kind of getting them to bring their walls down getting them to trust them like luring them into essentially a trap the way that he groomed her is with you know compliments he gave her a lot of attention he said everything a young girl wants to hear he said you're beautiful i really care for you you're my princess and he's just showering her with attention 
and Harlow's goal, it seemed, was to have her over, obviously, get her drunk, and have sex with her. At the time, he was also flirting with two other 15-year-old girls and a 13-year-old girl. When looking at his history, they found that he would even talk to girls as young as 12, and they also noticed that if the girl was 16 and over, he would not talk to her. He kind of changes tunes a little bit, and he tells Kaylee that he didn't want to have sex with her, and he felt like he wanted to wait until she was 16 before they did anything, and she agreed that she was not ready yet, but yeah, he just kept saying like, uh, like, I'm too old for you, like, kind of pulling away, but after pushing. So this kind of is another part of grooming in which they're building trust, they're building security in the victim, because now she's thinking, oh, well, he can't just be using me for sex because he's straight up saying he doesn't want it, but actions over words, baby. It's unfortunate that she's 15 years old because she doesn't know better, you know? And at 15, you feel grown. Like, I was 15 not too long ago, and I was like, I'm grown. I know what I'm doing. It's... I am 23 years old, and I still don't know what the hell I'm doing. But you can't tell a young person that, because if you say, oh, you're not grown, you don't know what you're talking about, it's immediately like they get defensive, you know? So this man most likely made her feel like she was a grown woman which a lot of teenagers don't get quote unquote enough of the vulnerability of the situation just is like bums me out i mean it's really sad he would also tell her don't tell anybody about us which shows obvious guilt on his part but she doesn't see that kaylee goes from i would have to be really drunk first in regards to them having sex to agreeing to spend the night with him from that very first time that they messaged each other, well, he messaged her to her going to spend the night was two weeks. It took two weeks for her to break her walls down. And, and that's not, you know, there's a grown man taking full advantage of a young girl. On Friday, November 13th, she told her parents that she was going to go to her friend Katie's house and spend the night. Which, like, is weird. Did she tell her parents or did she ask her parents? Because I would imagine if she's like, oh... Peace out, it's Friday the 13th, I'm gonna go to my friend's house. I would hope her parents are like, excuse me? <laughs> she had previously stayed the night with this friend before, so her parents did not think anything of it. Her mother says that the last time she saw her daughter was in the kitchen. She gave her about 10 pounds, which is like, again, this is an English case. And she said, don't spend it all at once. She kissed her goodbye and she walked out. And this part's weird. It says that, um, they said that Kaylee was dropped off at, uh, at like a somewhere that where she was gonna meet Luke, but they don't say who dropped her off. In the reenactment, it looked like it was like a like some sort of taxi driver. Which is like in that this is out of the ordinary for me. I mean, this, maybe it's a cultural difference. Like I said, they had met in a public place, and then later on, her and him went back to his place. They both started drinking and. It seemed like that night they might have had sex. That's what the documentary was hinting at, but they don't clearly say that. The next day, she texted her mom and she said, hey, can I spend the night again with the same friend? So her mother says, okay, yeah, sure. That night, that Saturday night, Luke invited over his neighbor, Steven. When looking at Steven's internet history later on, they see that he had a lot of unpleasant things. And the day before this Saturday, he was watching some hardcore stuff and they kind of hint that the women were maybe underage and it was sort of like a forceful vibe. Luke and Kaylee had ran out of mixers, they ran out of alcohol and so Luke goes next door to Stevens and asks for coke and lemonade. He also tells him that he had a bird at his place. I think that's English slang for a young girl, I'm pretty sure, um, but it was kind of like a wink wink like somebody's over there. And so they both leave to get more liquor, leaving her alone at the apartment for a bit. So she must have felt that secure with Luke that she didn't feel the need to escape or anything. And then they came back. Really quick, you guys, I interrupt this program to introduce you to today's sponsor. It is Consuming Crime's very first sponsor, and that is Audible. Dot com, which is an Amazon-owned company. They are the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, you get one free credit, and with our code, Consuming Crime, you can get one month free and one free audiobook. I actually use Audible myself. I don't really have time to sit down and read a book. I'm constantly moving around and you know doing school work the podcast things like that 
right now i am currently reading a book written by don miguel ruiz jr i love a lot of his works and the one i'm reading right now is called the mastery of self i am obsessed with self-development self-growth and this book really teaches you about knowing who you are knowing you know what you have to offer the world and just knowing that you know no one's better than anyone ever and i think it's really good to just be self aware with that being said again go on and head over to audibletrial.com slash consuming crime and get your free audiobook on us completely again that is audibletrial.com slash consuming crime now back to the story at 8 43 p.m her phone activity just abruptly stopped and they noticed well officers noticed when looking later on that normally it didn't stop till like 10 or 11. Like the night before, she didn't get off her phone until after 10 o'clock, and that's when she was with Luke. Now that she's with Luke and Steven, it cuts off earlier. At around 10.30 p.m., neighbors reported hearing screaming and banging from the complex, but neighbors didn't report this, by the way, until after the fact. Nobody actually in the moment called the police, which they questioned forensic psychologists about this, and she kind of gives you this BS about, oh, you know, people are probably getting home, they're drunk, they're not thinking anything of it, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, there is this thing, I'm not sure what it's called, I've been, ever since I watched the documentary a couple hours ago to now, I've been, like, in my brain about what the hell is this thing called. I learned it in psychology, and then I learned it again in my administration of justice class, but basically... It's the theory that if, let's say I live in an apartment complex and I hear somebody upstairs or downstairs screaming and banging noises, just like these people. The theory is that in my head, I'm thinking, oh, you know what? Like something's going on down there. I don't know what it is, but somebody has definitely already called the cops. And if they haven't, they will. I'm not the only one thinking that. Everybody else in the complex thinks that sort of like a domino effect and so it ends up being that nobody calls the police because we've assumed that somebody else already has that's what that is and i'm i'm going to 100 percent guarantee that's what was going through everybody's mind when they heard that to justify it in your brain you could say oh, i don't want to clog the phone lines like you know obviously somebody called already but that's not true you guys there was a dog on the side of the road like alive he was alive he was chilling he was well behaved by the carpool lane when i was driving and I had called the police and they were like, oh yeah, the dog on this freeway. And I was like, yeah. She was like, oh yeah, uh, people have already called. Um, we're on our way. And that bums me out because that means that that, how the hell did that dog in my town get more phone calls than this woman? It's just dumb. People are going to put more effort in when they feel like they're not going to get in trouble. I have no idea. But whatever happened was enough for her to run out of Luke's house or Luke's apartment half naked, barefoot. Stephen Beedman had chased after her and pinned her down. It was unclear if right now he was assaulting her, but somebody did pass by and see them on the floor together. At first, he thought that it was an officer restraining somebody, and then he thought it was just two lovers doing like sexy stuff. I don't, I don't know. He, <laughs> regardless, he brushed it off and walked away. If you see two people and they look like they might be having sex, I would totally yell. I'd be like, hey, 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 what are you doing? And if they're like, oh no, we're good. And like, uh, whatever. I'd be like, can you guys go somewhere private? Or I'd just call the cops. That's weird as hell. Oh, I'm sorry. Not sexy stuff. He called it a lover's tiff. After this, Stephen took her across the road into a nearby park and then that's when he raped her, and then after that took her to a farmland and bludgeoned her with a nearby rock. The documentary starts interviewing a forensic psychologist about Luke, and like, again, if you want to go back and figure out the mechanics of Luke Harlow's brain, go ahead, I'm not going to do that. The parents did not report her missing right away since they thought that she was still with her friend. The way that this came up is a witness was walking and they saw a phone. The phone was cracked and he couldn't get it to turn on. So he pulled the SIM card out and put it, I think he put it into a different phone. So he puts it into a different phone, chooses the last person that she had called, which was her friend Katie, the one she was supposed to be with. At that point, Katie calls her parents, tells her, you know, I haven't heard from her and she wasn't here. So then her parents call the police. The police came to the house and that's when the mother showed them Kaylee's tablet. And then that is where they found all of the messages. 
we're in the interview now with Luke Harlow and the police. And Luke is saying, I obviously feel bad. She's too young. That's pretty much all that the documentary shows that he says. He told the police that she left with Biedemann around midnight, the night that she was killed. At this time that he's being interviewed, I guess Biedemann is destroying everything. And police were viewing Luke as a witness. Mind you, they have yet to find the body. They start looking for Steven and they do find him at a family member's house with scratches and bruises all over his face. They launch a search and it was a huge search. There was hundreds of officers, hundreds of just people in the public that wanted to help. There was also heavy rain, so it was hard to look. And they even had helicopters, you guys. Which is odd to me because Luke lived six miles down the road from Kaylee. Steven was his neighbor. She couldn't have ran that far before he caught her. And then he said he took her to a nearby farmland, which you would think hundreds of people with a helicopter, you would find her body? Like on your own? But you guys, they don't find her body. At least not until Steven says something. They pick up Beadman and he's acting totally ignorant. He's saying he knows nothing. He does not know where she is. And he said he left around midnight back to his place to go to bed. After three days of questioning, this is like the seventh or eighth interview, he told somebody, finally, that the detectives were not going to find Kaylee. He then told detectives that he did rape and kill her, which eventually leads to him telling them, giving them like a general idea of where her body might be. They end up finding her body and she is butt naked. Um, I don't know where he put her clothes. I don't know if it washed off or something, but that is how he left a 15 year old girl. Like she was nothing. This was six days after she went missing that they found her body. Stephen Biedman was charged with the rape and murder of Kaylee, and Luke was charged on three counts of grooming and two counts of sexual activity with a minor. Biedman received life in prison, and he must serve at least 35 years. He could potentially get out and still be like in his 50s, 60s. Luke ended up getting 12 years. The host of the documentary series asks one of the forensic psychologists, what can we take from this? And she says, that the balance can be found in raising awareness, which I'm gonna, I disagreed with her earlier on the, uh, the theory of witnesses and making phone calls, but I'm gonna agree with her on this one. I think that a large part and a large reason why I'm so, like, personally, I'm so weary of others and stranger danger is because I grew up watching cases like Casey Anthony and cases where, you know, cases like these. At first I thought my mom was paranoid and now she's just realistic. I mean, maybe I'm paranoid, but you guys, I pulled pepper spray out on my maintenance guy like a couple weeks ago because he got too close to me in the dark. And maybe I looked funny, but it's honestly so much better to look a little crazy and paranoid and be safe than to just kind of be nonchalant. Lischester County launched a campaign after this, and they called it CEASE, and this was to tackle child sexual exploitation and to raise awareness. This case bums me out. Obviously, it's a young girl that died and she didn't have to die. I encourage all of you to talk to your kids, talk to your teenagers about the world, you know, and I, I'm always going to watch true crime documentaries. I know that my son's gonna be raised with his mom being the host of a true crime podcast and constantly watching this stuff so especially if you have little girls and i'm not saying that it cannot happen to a little boy because it obviously can statistically a girl is more likely to be targeted for stuff like this than a boy you know it doesn't hurt to have a conversation i definitely intend on having the you know when i have the sex talk with jackson i do intend on talking to him about the word consent and just things like that you know so yeah just be really careful with your babies you guys and just remember like if something ever happens like the most you could do is pray and do your best it's a scary world and i don't think that anybody should walk around paranoid and scared all the time but there's a balance there is a balance that's it for today guys and make sure you give us five stars wherever you're listening and if you have not already make sure you check us out on the patreon at the five dollar official level you'll have available six episodes ready to listen including the Aaron hernandez series as well as two additional episodes each month at the seven dollar all access level you'll have all of the previous benefits plus our regular content with no ads and at the twelve dollar vip level you'll have all of the previous benefits plus not only do you get to listen to me tell the story, you get to watch me tell the story. 
I'm losing my voice because it is two in the morning and that's usually how it happens um but anyway thank you guys for consuming crime with me today and you will hear me next week